Just a quick warning, this podcast series contains discussions about crime, trauma, sexual abuse, drug use and suicide. Listener discretion is advised. Kaiji Jing, welcome to The Sticker. Thank you for having me. One of the reasons why I've got you here today, I've got you on a podcast, because your story is inspirational. You are one of these kids that you'd be looking at it on the TV about all these troubled kids in all these troubled areas and that sort of thing, and you think to yourself, because you're one, you were one of those kids and you worked your mm-hmm. way out of there. You worked your way out of there. Yeah, Tell sure. us a bit about your life. What was your upbringing like? So upbringing, I guess, is like a lot of others, a bit rough, a bit tough. Where'd you um, grow up? What area? I lived all over different housing commissions. Now, but at the start, when my mum and dad were together, it was out in Cabramatta. So dad was in the game, mm. watching a lot of things from a young age. When you say in the game, what do you mean by that? Oh, man, I think it's selling drugs and all stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I just remember seeing a lot of things from a young age. Mm. Obviously abusive to my mum mm. and whatnot. I've seen a lot of trauma, a lot of violence and crime from a young age. Yeah. Which sort of normalised that thing. Dis- dysfunctional. 100%. Did you, what, did you grow up and thinking that was the normal way to live? It's a funny thing, that one. It's just, I think, in terms of growing up, the only time I saw success, if defining success is based on money, the only thing on how to make money is that way. The criminal way. Yeah. I'll so you don't, the same way. You never, get, you never get shown that different perspective on maybe going to school and studying or doing whatever to make an honest living. You only see sort of one side of it. And violence played a big part in your upbringing? Yeah, 100%. Always seen my dad, built my mum and that. Yeah. And what about understand. on the streets? You would have been, I grew up in Aldrua, very similar. Arm um, robber, like back in the day, I spied to be an arm robber. You would have seen other criminals and that sort of stuff, people that were rocking it, and you thought, fuck, I want to be like that. Yeah, for sure. And like always growing up, you when you watch movies and that, and you're listening to music, and you're watching music videos, and all that sort of crime is glorified and that. Yeah. It always makes you think, oh, what would that, that stuff looks cool. Like, why not try that stuff? How was school for you? School was, so this is the thing with me, like school, like I didn't go to the worst schools. I didn't really go to public schools. So I was fortunate enough because my dad's mum paid for my school fees. So she'd give money for school fees, but wouldn't give money for nothing else. Mm. So it was me and my mum living in the housing commission, we're still broke as, and my younger sister, but we had good education. Mm. So I was going to schools in good areas, going to a school with well-off kids, yep. but then I was still poor at home. So yep. it was a strange sort of dynamic how did that make you feel, though, like, at school when there's that dysfunction? You got the, you're different than those kids. Was you, was there a feeling of that, that you were different? Yeah, than always. It's hard to explain. I just didn't really feel like I connected with much people at school. Didn't really feel like I got along. Mm. I wasn't always the best. That I wasn't always that book smart. Yeah. So that sort of led to that disconnect in school from a young age. Yeah. And what, did you, when, what age did you finish school at? I got three weeks into year 11 before I got locked up. Yeah. Let's talk about that. When did what age did you start getting into trouble? I say I started petty thieving from like eleven. Yeah. Just petty thieving, stealing from the shops, maybe breaking in the cars, stealing the cars. But I didn't really start doing arm robs and that until I was about fifteen, just before I turned fifteen. Yeah. That's when I started doing some like more hectic yeah, stuff. Yeah, because you, you, you escalated very quickly, didn't you? Yeah. I was, from fourteen to fifteen was like, I don't know what. Like it was just a crime spree that went way too long, man. It was like. Yeah, and what did what did what when you say a crime spree? What the, what sort of crimes were involved? I love doing arm robs. Yeah, I don't know, just yeah. a lot of arm robs. Yeah, what was it that? What was your, your first? What was your first interaction like with the police? How old were you when you started interacting with the police? When they, you started to come to their attention? When I started to actually come to their attention, I was probably fourteen. But like, I'd always get pulled over by cops and that when I was younger, being out too late or just running amok. Mm. Just doing stupid stuff as a little kid, but I never really got charged or anything. But I got my, like, my first caution when I was like 14 for a break and Yeah. So that's when I first started. And what was your reaction? What, how did, how, what was the treatment like off the police? How did they treat you? I remember the f- when I was 14, first time I got done for a break and like old mate for no reason just grabbed me, full smashed my head up against a paddy wagon for no reason, mm. and then threw me in the back of the truck. Mm. That was my first interaction. What was the, the what, what was the impression you were left to? What impression did you have of the police after that? Did you respect them? No, no way. I thought, why is this guy grabbing a little kid and smashing, roughing him up for no reason? You know what I mean? I say it a lot. I say, and I, I get people offside with it, and I say, in a lot of those troubled areas, the police are half the problem with the way they treat those. Hundred percent. And uh, and their interaction with those kids could be far greater. Their communication with those kids would 
be a game changer if they chose to go that way instead of using violence. And, and, and I'm the same. My first interaction with the police, I got shit bashed out of me for doing nothing, sitting around a bonfire, mm. sitting around and, and stripped naked and humiliated. So tell us about that. So when you got arrested, because you served a pretty big sentence for a kid, didn't you? Mm. Like, yeah, you know, four and a half. You, you actually served four and a half years. What yeah. were you sentenced to and what, what for? I was sentenced to nine years with a non parole period of four and a half for, I think, six arm robs, a carjacking, two firearms, a couple of GBHs. Man, that's a rapid escalation, isn't it? Where yeah. do you think that come from? Was it one of those? Talk, talk me through that process. Why did you escalate and why did you feel you had to take it to the next level? Look, the whole GBH part wasn't, there was no intention to hurt people. Mm. The GBH part just just happens in the heat of the moment. And the thing with arm robs was it's the easiest way. Mm. You don't have to walk around on the streets for four hours trying to make an urn and mm. break into people's houses. And, and what were the arm robs on? Servos. Yeah. Service stations or convenience stores. Yeah. Because my, my, my son Kai, he was... He done. He was at Baxter with you. He was mm. serving. He got charged with kidnapping a child molester or a potential child molester and torturing him and that. And he was telling me, he said, "Dad, you got to talk to this young bloke, Kaiser." He said he's got the most amazing story. That sentence, in adult terms, is like a fourteen-year, maybe a twelve-year bottom. Yeah, easy. Because because the courts are, are less harsh on 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 young offenders, and that that sentence, if that was. An adult sentence, I reckon that would be like 20 with an 11, 11 year bottom. That's what that would have mm. been the parody in that type of sentence. But what happened? What, tell me about the arrest and what it got. Any other task force and that? Yeah, like that? so there was a strike force on us mm. under surveillance by state crime, robbery mm. serious crime squad. Parramatta. Uh, we got arrested by TOU, yeah. Tactical Operations Unit. Facts and heavy. Oh, man, that was the worst time I've ever been arrested. Shot rubber bullets, mm. tasered, flash banged. Yeah. Like How old were you flogged. at this stage? Fifteen. Fifteen. I was in hospital for a day. Yeah. Broken rib, face was gone. Couldn't they, even remember anything. I had the worst concussion. Mm. Yeah, it was. And they bashed you, yeah. They flogged us. Yeah. Flogged us. It's funny. They done. They could have just. Obviously, I understand. I done crime and whatever, and I did a lot of things. But like, it's two wrongs don't make a right. And yeah. if you can, there's no reason to treat a fifteen year old like some forty year old drug kingpin. Yeah. Like I was fifteen. Like sure, they like full crashed us into a pole. Like proper like tactical style. I remember style. this. I remember this. Jumped out, shot us rubber bullets. Mm. They reckon they gassed us, but bullshit. Like they flashbanged us, mm. pulled us out. Like full just flogged us. Like if I show you like the brief. And they all wrote statements of what they did. Mm. They reckon I was saying to us, do you understand you're under arrest? Do you understand this? And like, the only words I was hearing, you're a fucking scumbag. You think you want to rob people? Just full stomping on my head. Mm. And I remember after, they reckon they tasered me when I was sitting in the car. But I remember after they handcuffed me, one of them like says behind me, fuck it, taser him as well. Mm. So you were handcuffed and Handcuffed then and tasered. Mm. And it's funny too, they're all wearing body cams. And when we try to subpoena it in court, they reckon it all went missing. Yeah, it's always the okay. case. Yeah, so what can you do? So with that, you get caught, you go before, what, what, what was the court process for you? Like, where, where did you go to Baxter? Did you, where, where were you on remand? Cobham first. Yeah. Cobham first for three months. And what was that like the first time there? Look, Cobham's a good centre, I'll be honest. Yeah. Cobham's a good centre. They got it right there. Yeah. Staff are good, aren't like scumbags. To mm. the kids and that. But then after three months, I went up to Baxter. So that place is, it's, I don't know. It's a bit I went and see my son there. That's just a prep for jail. Yeah, 100%. They're just prepping kids there for jail, just getting them ready for jail. Getting them, the, that's just the whole jail routine, airlocks and shit like that. That's just, for me, I don't know what good that place does to rehabilitate children. From the get-go, like the whole court process would have been heavy because you would have had to get sentenced in a district court, yeah. then, didn't you? Yeah, took me 18 months to get sentenced. To get sentenced. Yeah. So you're on remand for 18 months. And What was that like, not knowing your fate? Like, I wish I was on remand a bit longer, to be honest, because I didn't think I was going to get as long as I got, Yeah. considering it was my first time yeah. being sentenced. First offence, yeah. Yeah, first offence. So when I got sentenced, it was like, fuck, like I had another three years to serve. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, I was like, I was spilling a bit. I was a bit yeah. gutted. I think, look, I think it's, but it was better though, because once you're sentenced and you're off remand, you can do a lot more programs. So Upper yeah. Baxter, man, the school is very good. Yeah. They're very like good with helping boys get into courses and educating themselves. Yeah. So if I can say one thing from that Baxter Centre is amazing, the school, yeah. 
the school up there. Is and education has played a big part in your turnaround, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, very big. Very you're, big you're a young fella that embraced it to its fullest. Yeah, I'm very big on education. Yeah. So education helps shift that perspective yeah. on how to make money. Yeah. I feel like a big reason why kids go commit crime is because that lack of education. Yeah. When you start to realise and you start to educate yourself, it's not too hard to make money in this country. Yeah. We're very blessed. We live in a good country. Who were the people that stood out and why did those people st stand out to you that you encountered in those boys' homes? The, so the first time I saw some people that really stood out to me was when Confit first come in. Joseph Joe. Kwan and yeah, the gang. Yeah, Joe Kwan and that. Because that was boys that had been through the same thing. Done time, especially Joe, he said the 90 sentence. You don't usually come back from stuff like that. He managed to turn his life around. He managed to use his story to get into places yeah. and to make an honest living. So that was the first time that I really saw someone else. Maybe... Experience. Maybe this... And that's what started, kick-started that thing in, in like inside me. It was like, I have an interesting story. Big shout out to Joe and the gang. Joe's yeah, shout out to them. You guys are amazing. I love what you do, and I plan on getting you and Joe back together. And what, what like, what was, mate, it's a real hard, like, I, I feel for you, man, going through that process where these coppers have given, do you reckon you came out with uh, trauma from that arrest? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I still have flashbacks from that arrest, but man, there's just, the only thing that's helped me deal with that a bit more was all my childhood. Yeah. Like, I'd already been through so much as a kid. That was just something else to add to the list. Yeah, yeah. But of course there's trauma, man. I got this first time I've ever been shot at in my life and yeah. I got shot at by cops. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't understand rubber bullets and all that. So when yeah. I'm getting hit with stuff, I thought I was getting shot with rubber bullets and that. Yeah. So I thought I was, and like when I got flash banged, like everything goes white. Yeah. But you know, when you hear people, they say like they've had near death experience, they say they see like that white light. Man, I yeah. thought I was dying. Yeah, yeah, wow. So like that's the closest I've ever been to death in my life. All right, let's, let's get back to three and a half to go after court. What was that process like? You, uh, uh, that's a daunting process, isn't it? You know, mm. It's a daunting process. You're going through. Did you try beating anything? Did you try challenging anything? Nah, I, just, I didn't even go for bail. I knew what I'd done. Took accountability as a man. Yeah. And I just said, look, this is my time to... It took me 18 months to start to... It took me till I got around the time I got sentenced to start to shift that perspective and think, fuck, I think I need to do something different. Yeah. It took me a good... So that first 18 months, I was still just mucking up being an idiot. Yeah. But once that 18 months hit, I started a little step. And I said, let me like just let me just try to be good a bit. You were one of the heads. You were one of the main heads in them boys. Homes where you were a leader, you weren't a follower. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's funny. Like when I look back... Because there's a hierarchy in them boys' homes, yeah. isn't there? Can you explain about the hierarchy? I wouldn't say there's always, there's not really like a head head person, yeah. but there's like a group of boys. Yeah. And then the boys, like mm. the boys that usually like a ruthless and will punch on and mm. the soldiers, they'll stick together. Yeah. And then your boys that just get stood over and that, they usually mm. band together with a couple of mates. Yeah. Or they just sit on their own. It's funny in there, like you see it, like you always see it, like when a new person comes in, it's not really known. Mm. You see the boys try to joke, joke around with them a bit, just try to test the water, see if these yeah. boys are soldier or. Yeah. And then you see once they like once say if someone puts them on like on a bitch mm. and they cop it, mm. gone. See yeah, they're gone. Yeah, they'll cop it for the rest of their time. Yeah, that's that wolf mentality. It's my young bloke was he. Came, I knew because I've done all the boys' homes and I knew he was going to come out of so like he was up at that the one up near Grafton and Akmina and then when he came out I said this place will change you. You know what I mean? Mm. He came back. He went from a boy to a man. I think in a lot of ways, good and bad. Tell me about. What's the importance of a like a good male role model in your life? You obviously got it with Joe and, and the gang at Confit. And I see it a lot, what's going on with these crimes and everything, got these crime rate. A lot of them kids don't have a good role model. Mm. What's the importance of a good role, male role model in your life? For me, the role model was more just seen another way. Yeah. It wasn't more so sit you down, pat you on the back, hey, mate, you're doing a good job. That, it wasn't that for me. I've never really had that, mm. like a father. Mm. I've more had, I'm very big, like I'm like I'm a quick learner. Yeah. I'm always pretty switched on in that. So I'm top, like I can see something and I can, I can like I know when I'm seeing something good. So mm. for me, where the Confit Boys played a big role was it just showed me another way. Yeah. And bringing fitness into your life and the structure of fitness and the routine of fitness yeah. is massive, isn't it? It's good for discipline. I wouldn't say f fitness for me was a part it wasn't the whole part of me changing my life. Yeah. But even like, I always say now, me getting locked up was the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. It's like almost in a sense going to the army. Yeah. But not. It's that we're structured into a routine and you have to do it. You've got no choice, right? You've got to wake up at a certain time. You've got to tuck your shirt in. You've got to, when you're mm. walking on movements, you've got to make your bed. You've got to do this. So in juvie, it's all, if you don't make your bed in the morning, you don't get, you don't earn your points to get your TV and your incentives and that sort of mm. stuff. So it's really structured like that. 
Yeah. So that's, that's where... I think all kids perform well to structure. Mm. I think, and that's what happens with, we're talking about these troubled areas. I'm going to keep referring back to the these troubled kids because you're the lived experience guy. That You're the answer to that. Mm. You, Joseph, people like myself, Jeff Morgan and others, we're going to be able to educate them more than a cop of a clipboard that's mostly bashed these kids yeah, at some 100%. stage in their life. And these kids are going to listen to people like us more than they're going to listen to some copper that wants to fucking rub a bullet and fucking flashbang them and all that sort of stuff. Mm. That's that. We've got to get away from those sorts of people giving sort of any advice on what kids should be doing. The importance of structure in your life. Tell me about that. Tell me what it does for your life in particular. Obviously, I didn't have no stability with my father because my father's bashing my mum. Yeah. But then there'd be times when my mum was leaving for months. Mm. It's funny, I've been learning about trauma a bit over these past couple of months and over more these past couple of days. And, you know, it's funny that trauma isn't what happened to you. It's a result of what happens. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what happened to you. Yeah, yeah. So even though my mum leaving... That's a good way. That's a good description. So right? even though my mum leaving yeah. was her just trying to get to safety, mm. as a young kid, what that meant to me was abandonment. He didn't even want to, want to look after me either. He'd just go dump me at some random person's house to look after me. Mm. It's that... That lack of stability is where boys start going onto the street. And I try to think, what's a common theme between me and my boys? And a lot of it is that stability growing up of no no parent. Yeah, the underlying issue of it all is that. And, and I think that's the bit, that lack of stability and attachment as a young kid is what then leads to all that lack of education and lack of this and lack of that. And for me, the, the domestic violence is what led to that lack of attachment and stability as a young kid. But it can be a, a range of things. It could be parents that are junkies. Mm. And that lack of attachment is from them just getting on the drugs all the time. It, yeah. it could be a range of things. So that intergenerational trauma too. It's that intergenerational trauma, but what we normalise, you normalise violence. So mm. when you're doing armed robberies and doing those sorts of things and violent, mate, that's normal to you. Yeah, 100%. But that's how people act because that's what you grew up and being around. And, and that's the beauty about doing the trauma work. We realised, I had a guy, man, I have these people all the time contacting me and go, oh, it's a bank. I was a teller in a bank. And the bank that you robbed, they are, that you're the there was a thousand people in there that day. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they all want me, all these people want me to fucking say sorry to them. And but this bloke was actually a bank teller and that yeah. sort of thing. And it's been interesting talking to him. I've been talking to him over the weekend and getting trauma from his perspective. Because mm. when he explains it, whatever he explains, he felt I've been feeling that my whole fucking life. Yeah, 100%. And all I've done when I've done that crime is just fucking projected onto him. Mm. And he felt my pain. He had to carry my pain. He was just an innocent victim on it. When you talk about doing some trauma work, how do you feel about your victims? Look, it's a tough one because, like, obviously what I've done was shit. And I'm a religious man, so obviously I sinned and I, I affected other people. Yeah. But would I go back and change it? I wouldn't even, no. Nah. Mm. Because I wouldn't be here sitting here today with you. Yeah. I wouldn't be doing the work. So I work in government at the moment. Mm. I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing, sitting with politicians and ministers and talking to them and shifting their perspective yeah. on young people that yeah. commit crime. Yeah. So it's, it's weird. It's a funny one. Talk about what was it like the day you got released? How good's that? Yeah, fuck. I can't explain the feeling. You know the feeling. Yeah, like, yeah. It's just like, no, because I always used to tell people around me, workers and inside the centres and my psych and all that, that I'm never coming back. I'm 100. percent And you get the ones say, "There's never a such thing as 100." percent I mm. told them, I look them in the eyes. I can fucking tell you right now, I will never see a cell ever again. Yeah. And people go, whatever. But I knew the day I walked out, I would fucking never see a cell again. Yeah. Like I knew it from the bottom of my heart. But there's a reality too, and I, I talk about this, uh, and there's a reality of when you do get out, there's this thing that dawns on you that you go, fuck, man, I've got to start living now. Mm. There's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it was a rude shock coming out. You know what I mean? So well, how long did you end up in five years, four, four years? Four and a half. Yeah, yeah. So when it, you get, look, it's funny, like you go into the same problems and you get released. So you went in at four, 15. 15, got, out. got released at 20. Yeah, wow. So it's funny, you go in, like, the, so the reason why I went in was obviously a lot of range of issues, but mainly financial. Yeah. Like, I went in for financial gain, being broke, and you get released with the same problem. I'm still broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and, but amplified with a few other problems as yeah, well. Yeah, amplified with a few other problems, but different is I got out with a plan. Yeah, yeah. I knew what I was doing. Yeah. I knew where I wanted to go. That's massive, having a plan. That's why I found my purpose. My purpose was helping survivors of institutional abuse. And when you have a plan and a goal and you understand what your purpose is in life, you're on another level, man. That's what I mean. I go back into the centre now and talk to the boys and I go, what are you doing when you get out? You got a job? Or oh, I'll sort it out when I get out. No, it doesn't fucking work like that. You're here, bro. Do it while you're here. Yeah. This is why you're here. You got to talent. figure out your life before you come out. Procrastination's the killer of dreams. 100%. That's the killer of dreams. And it's really important, like, guys like, man, I'll tell you what, if I was if I was a young fella sitting in one of those boys' homes and you're turning back up looking all fit and everything like that, I'm listening to you. Mm. 
I'm listening to you. And what's what, how do you, you know how do kids respond to you when you do go back in there and talk to them? They listen, but it's whether do they retain it or not. Yeah. yeah. So come. It's like you ever what you ever watched like a motivational speech on like YouTube and it gets you all pumped up and yeah. jacked and then thirty minutes later you just yeah, what the fuck was what the that? fuck was that yeah like I feel like the same thing sometimes with the boys right like you come in they got like they got about five people sitting in front of them that've been done jail done this done that they listen that's whether they retain it or not yeah do they really can they really picture doing what we're doing right but what you're doing though is you're planting seeds. I remember a guy came in 1987 and ran a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. I, and, and I never got it there and then, but I got it years later. Mm. So the beauty of what you're doing, man, is you're going in and planting seeds. Tell us about this. Tell us what's your advice to these kids that are going through... Uh, well, now, let's take it back. Let's take it back. What's your advice to the politicians that are making decisions on these kids that are going through all these troubled areas. You're talking Alice Springs and Townsville to mention a few. What advice do you give? What, what do them kids need to change? I think they need to go sit there with the kids themselves and see what the real problem is before mm. they make their decisions. Mm. A lot of people make decisions, a lot of people in positions of power make decisions not knowing what the truth is mm. and how it is really in there. So that's where like my role's been really good because mm. I get to sit in rooms with important people mm. and I get to tell them how it is and yeah. how what's how my life's affected me and whatnot. And it's I don't expect that I shift all their perspectives, but as long as I shift one or two, I yeah. think that's a win. And what do you tell them? What what, what is it? What what do these kids need? So firstly, man, before I come out, I've got to give a shout out to my boss because mm. obviously she gave me mm. she threw she gave me a thread to hang on to, man, and she created the opportunity for me. So my boss, her name is Zoe Robinson, mm. man. She's like just a good person. Yeah, yeah. That gave me opportunity. Doesn't care about anything else, but sees like the goodness in the person and yeah. gives the person opportunity. So she's the whole reason that I have all this opportunity right now, meeting all these important people. Mm. She was in a position of power, and she gave me the opportunity. What's you know? Zoe's position? So she's the advocate for children, and young people, yeah. like a commissioner. So I met her when I was in the boys' home in, yeah. in Baxter, and it was good. I met her. I don't believe in luck, right? I believe luck is where hard work meets opportunity. Yeah, beautiful. So when I met her, I'd already put in all this hard work, done my HSC, and I was mentoring boys around me because I seen how to do your time rough, seen how to do it easy. Yeah. I was trying to get boys to teach them, this is how you do time easier. You know what I mean? Yeah. So she seen me when I was doing all that. She liked what I was doing and she said, look, I've got some work around crime if you want to do when you get out. And I said, yeah, I'll give you a call. And man, the rest has been history. Wow, that's powerful, man. That's fucking powerful. Man, and you've done the work. You've done the work. And that's what I, and that's been the big difference for me this time. I've done 23 fucking years. In the end, I realised I've got to work on this. I, I, that's up to me. It's up to me to fucking... I'm not going to... These people ain't necessarily going to give me the opportunity to fucking make a change. I've got to create it. And I think it's so important. Talk about getting called into Parliament. This is exciting. Yeah, it was crazy. So I spoke at Parliament last Friday... It was about getting more access to like outpatient mental health. Yeah. Because like, yeah. obviously there's a big backlog in mental health and yeah. when you're trying to get help, it's hard. So I, I just went in there and I shared my story on how on my experiences of mental health, how mental health affected me being in school, how it affected me not want to stay home. Mm. And ultimately it probably led to me getting locked up. And it was just, I didn't really, I didn't go in there speaking about stats or this and that. It was just, it was merely my story, right? And mm. I don't think they hear enough stories of young people, especially changing their lives. So I think it was good just to... I even had one one politician at the end, I think she's a shadow minister, mm. and she like she just goes, I want to put on the record that I respect you and changing your story, and I know you're proud of yourself. But it was just good that hearing that from someone in a position like that, it's just it's refreshing and it makes my work mean more. And But all these, all us troubled people or traumatised people need validation. We need to hear that. Mm. It's so important. It's so important that someone says that. See, the the antidote for trauma is love, self-belief, self-care. And that's part of it. When someone gives you a nice compliment, they're part of your healing journey. I really believe that. 100%. I, I, I believe that. And talk about that. Where did you realise, obviously... You've been exposed to a lot of trauma as a kid and then, and then carried on to your interactions with the police. It's been amplified. Talk about when did you identify you were going through trauma? When did you realise, hang on, this ain't fucking right how I'm feeling? You know what's funny? I probably maybe only a couple of months ago. Yeah. Wow. I, I was really good at suppressing stuff yeah. as a young kid and always just pushing it to the side. Even when I changed my life around, I just ignored it all, suppressed it. I was very good at just... Shutting it all down because yeah. I knew that I've never had a time to be vulnerable and expose myself. In lockup, like I said, if you're that kid that sits there and cops shit, 
you're the bitch of the unit, bro. You cop it. Mm. So you ain't got time to show your emotions. And mm. if you're going to cry, you better fucking hope you say that shit until you go back to your room. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then even as a young kid, I didn't have time to show emotion. Like I had to be, I had to look after my sister from young age because my mum had to, like she couldn't. Mm. So I never really had time to, to be human and mm. be vulnerable. Now that I'm living a normal life, I have stable employment and stable house and all this sort of stability in my life. I think I finally realised that and I have support now. I have strong support important, and right? love. So it's just, I've, I feel like now I finally have a time just to sit back and actually focus on my mind and think, why do I have the certain thoughts that I have? Why do I feel this certain way when I wake up in the morning sometimes? What's happened in my life that's creating these problems? So, yeah. yeah. But I, I look at you and I see a searcher. I see someone that's searching for more, that, that wants better. And, and searches always find something. Mm -hmm. What have you found? What I've found is that being selfish isn't too bad. Mm. You no, know, I was always a person that I put the boys first in front of my mum and my sister, and it got me five years. I can help other people around me just by helping myself. Mm. It will help me do my job better. Mm. It helped me be a better son, a better brother. And I'm very big that everyone has a light to bring into this world. Everyone's obligated to mm. bring a light into this world. And obviously certain stuff happens in life that sort of dims your light, but then then you're obligated to help yourself. Mm. No one's fucking come to save you. Yeah. You got to want to help yourself. 100%. No, it's, that's great. It's very, it, you're very introspective and it's a, for how old are you? 21. Wow, man. You're a dude that you've gotten deep, brother. You pulled out a yeah. and shovel. Man. I, I don't go out much, man. I stay, honestly, I'm a big thinker. It's probably a bit of anxiety, mm. chronic anxiety, but I'm always thinking. My brain's just always going... But I don't try to shut it down because it always leads somewhere. Mm. I go down these rabbit holes sometimes when I'm trying to sleep at night. Mm. And it leads to thoughts and I write these thoughts down. Even when I was locked up, always just thinking. Didn't really watch TV, just always thinking, always trying to reflect on my life. I'm a big mm. reflector. Mm. I reckon there's a reflect and dissect. 100% you know? reflect and dissect. Yeah, reflect and dissect and work out what worked and what didn't and how it worked. And I'm massive on it, I'm massive on it. I, man, I'm a big gratitude person. Mm. Yeah, For sure. I'll write gratitude lists, man. And you know what, I'm, what, in that gratitude, and I talk to a lot of young fellas, I said, mate, even the ones that are locked up, I say, mate, just wake up, start writing your gratitude list and let's see how your day goes. It's the best thing, gratitude. Yeah. It just makes you realise the small stuff. It's the conduit to your peace and happiness. As that conduit, it's, you start being... I think universally, gratitude, when you're aware of it, it creates more of those little things turn into big things and those big things turn into great things. And I'm massive. I told my young bloke today, the importance of that, like the importance that you've had Joe and the boys and Kai's had a guy called Liam Callaghan, who's Cal Callahan is a professional boxer. And mm. Liam just said, no shit. Mm. said, fuck the phone, fuck the Facebook, fuck all the Instagram mm. and give him structure as you've got. And he's going really well. He used to want to be fucking Tupac. Now he just wants to be a working man. Yeah, you know no, I've got on him. That's yeah, good. he's a good kid. And that's it, man. I, I love hearing this story. And I, I really, I think you're, you, Kaiser, you're, you're inspirational and you're the future, man. You are the future oh, of those decision makers. And you're that guy. You're going to be that go-to guy. You know what I mean? You are. You're going to be the face of change for these mm. kids. You know. No, what I, mean? I hope so. That's what I'm trying to do, man. Just try to give back. But then, like, I just, like I said before, I'm just bettering myself, and it's helping me make things better for other people. You touched on a, a thing you said about the light. They talk about that a lot in the Muslim religion. Mm. They talk about the light, and I, there was. I'm trying to think. There was a Muslim, a mufti at Muhammad Ali's. Uh, uh, funeral thing and he spoke about this light it was one of the most beautiful speeches I've ever seen and it was prolific in my own life how I visualise things and yeah it's such a beautiful thing the light light's a beautiful thing you keep mm. it shining your light brother 100%. and like even on that religion thing like submitting to a higher power so obviously I'm a Muslim yeah. like submitting to a higher power always keeps you humble and it, it helps you get through tough times and even like with my whole story everything that's happened doesn't matter all the trauma that I've been through and that doesn't mean that God didn't love me, but it's happened for a reason to get me to where I am. Mm. So that's why I'm always grateful for God and for everything that's happened in my life, no matter good or bad. Mm. And I think you show that appreciation that turns up more and more. It's that gratitude, right? Mm, 100%. Mate, tell me a daily thing. Fitness has played a part in your life. You like keeping fit. What do you do? How, what's your sort of training routine? Obviously, I can't train as much as yeah. I did when I was locked up. Yeah. And like we were talking before, I don't... So we, it's funny, I listen to Dave Goggins a lot. Yeah. And he spoke about he's gonna he's willing to cap success. Yeah. So he can always constantly be an animal. And I don't believe in a balanced life, right? I believe in trade offs. Mm. So I've gotten to a point now where 
fitness has, has played a big part in structure and discipline. And it's not that saying that I don't strain, but I'm willing to cap my fitness for success mm. because fitness only gets you so far and it gets you looking good and it has you feeling good. So I still, I run every morning. Mm. I try run every morning, but I don't train as much as I did, but it's because what, what pushes me now, what drives me now is just wanting to learn. Mm. I wanted to be my, the best version of myself. And I'm just trying to, f I'm just trying to exponentially grow myself and I really want to be successful. That's my goal. That's mm. my vision. Fuck, that's powerful, brother. That's powerful. I'm a big Wes Watson fan. You're a Wes Watson fan? Yeah, yeah. he's crazy. He just, motherfucker, you fat <laughs> motherfucker. I'm sitting on the fucking lounge, motherfucker. Get off and fucking, your wife hates you. Oh, I just, I love that guy. I was just listening to him before I got here, you know what I mean? And that's the importance. And now let's talk about role models for you. Like you talk about David Goggins. I love David Goggins. Yeah, you know he's crazy. I mean? Yeah. What's the importance of guys like that? You're obviously this is that part of you, the searcher. You're looking for that person or that thing to make you better. Who do mm. you find? In terms of inspiration. Who do I find inspiration? In? So a lot of my motivation is intrinsically. I'm very an intrinsically motivated person. So mm -hmm. I can I'm always good at motivating myself. But you know where I do look up to people like Goggins and whatnot is because it helps you just not play that victim and not be a bitch. Like yeah. I have every man. I, if anyone's going to play the victim, man, I have every right to just sit back on the couch every day and say, man, my fucking dad fucked my life up, man, mm. my fucking mum, my fucking this, my fucking that. Yeah. But I don't do none of that shit. Yeah. I, sit, I sit there and go, man, that story, I'm mm. grateful for child abuse and child mm. trauma and mm. all that sort of shit because it's given me a story. Mm. If I didn't have the story, it wouldn't get me into half the rooms I was in today. Yeah. So where I love Goggins and all that sort of stuff, man, it helps you just not play the victim. I'm really big on not playing the victim. That's, and it's also accountability, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. What part has that played? Same with me. I went through hell and back, but it was up to me to change because them other people who'd done that, who the abusers weren't going to change me. Mm. They'd changed me to a point where I didn't like myself and, and they played a part in that. But the important part of change was, and that narrative in my head that I listened to, I, 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 cho I, I, the, I choose the narrative. Mm. You choose your narrative. And what's the importance of that, that, that accountability? I think the importance of that accountability is just you got to realize, like you said, you got to be the one to fix your problem. Yeah. Even with trauma, right? You're not the cause of your own trauma. Mm. Whoever it may be in your life that's abused you, abused others around you, and you got that trauma, but at the end of the day, you got to go find the solution to that problem. Yeah. Everything in life is always up to you. You're the person that chooses whether to succeed or not. You're the person that chooses whether to lay in bed and not get up in the morning and train. Just be accountable to yourself and have pride in yourself, right? Because that pride is what keeps you going. Be proud of who you are and hold yourself with pride. What do you say to the 15-year-old just being pinched, just being traumatised? What do you say to that 15-year-old kid walking into Cobham right now? What's the advice you give to that 15-year-old you? I think I just say to him, just give him what you're doing. Because mm. eventually it worked out. Yeah. Right? And it's unfortunate <laughs> that for... Well, for not for a lot of kids, it doesn't work out like I do. Mm. So, at what point in, on the timeline in my life did I did that light bulb flick? And I think it was a range of things, right? I think it was religion, education, fitness. I think it was, it was more of a holistic approach. I don't think there was one thing. And mm. the big thing has been the support and love mm. that you know that I have in my life now. Who give you that love? Tell me. The love from my mum and my sister, it's it's different, right? Cause my mum, like me, and my mum, like I love my mum to death. I take a bullet for her. Mm. A lot of that stuff that's happened in my childhood has affected our relationship and it's affected the, the closeness mm. of that relationship. But a big person has been in my life, my current my current boss, Zoe Robinson, man, mm. like she's just, since I've been out, the support she's given me and she's just backed me every step of the way and like just ignored everything I've done in the past and just looked at me as a human. Mm. Good. And it's just like, it's just made me feel like, man, like, yeah, like it's crazy, like. Mark Burris said to me a few weeks ago, or a month ago, he said, Russell, all you needed was someone to believe in you. He said, for you to make that change, for life to be good to you, for life to be kind to you. Zoe Robinson, is she that? She's that, one, she's that one person that's finally... I've had people that have believed in me, like when I was locked up. Obviously, there's some people that say, you'll be great in that, but true belief gets fucked, man. I can't even like, explain it, man. And she's backed you up by creating that opportunity. Backed for me you. up, doesn't even, doesn't even care. If people look at her funny for putting me in a room. She'll just do what she's... Amazing man. Yeah, do whatever. It's important to have that person. I've got a couple. My I've got a 
barrister as a girlfriend, she was that one who, she pointed out what I was going to do. She was, she, as much as I wanted to do it, I wanted mm. to make a difference. She was the one who just said, here's a little game plan for you. Have a fucking crack at that. And, I, mm. and at first, I didn't believe I could fucking do it. But isn't it amazing what happens when you apply yourself something to, to, mm. to something? You go, yeah, fucking I'm in. I'm committed. 100%. And even just once you apply yourself and you're committed, knowing that you always just have one person to always lift you up, mm. it will be that rock for you to fall back on when yeah. shit doesn't go right. Fuck, it just makes such a big difference. And that's why I didn't have as a young kid, right? I didn't have my mum, I didn't have my dad for that. For me, yeah, you know, that it just fucking makes such a big difference. And honestly, I've come to the conclusion now that the fucking main reason I reckon the start of a fucked up life is from young kid love and not having love and stability. And you know, it's funny learning about trauma when you start learning about trauma and the psychology behind it, it makes you realize a bit that this is where all shit went wrong in your life. It's funny, they say the first 2000 days of your life is the most important, yeah. And for a baby, right? So the part of your brain that's in charge of recollect, uh, recollection, recalling memories is not even, is, is still offline, but your nervous system, so the um, memory from emotions can be embedded into your nervous system mm -hmm. when you can't even recall memory. Mm -hmm. So a child understands abandonment and not having love. Mm -hmm. like, it's crazy when you think of shit like that, man. Yeah, crazy. Baby can remember, I can remember parts of my mum being belted and that sort of stuff and my mum leaving, but I can't remember every memory. But the emotions from that shit that happened when I was a young child is embedded into my nervous system. And, and I can't even record it. It's in your subconscious. And 100%. that's the whole stuff with dealing with, you know what I mean, and getting deep, man. You're that, man, you, you're amazing. You have fucking such great insight for someone your age. Like, I mean, you're, you've are you got a 50-year-old head on your shoulders, man. Yes, I'm, I'm blessed. But I think life experience brings that wisdom. Yeah. When you've got to stand on your own two feet from a young age, fuck, you have to grow up. You've got no other choice. And even when I was younger, having to look after my sister and that when I probably should have to be looked after myself. I was tucking my sister in bed when I should have been tucked in the bed. Yeah. And having to stand on your own two feet like that and be responsible for another young life if you got to grow up you got no chance you don't got no choice in your experience in the boys homes in the criminal world did you see many well-rounded kids from loving homes validated kids supported kids in that lifestyle you see the odd every now and then like i remember there was some there was a kid i was locked up with when say his name but he got done for like stabbing people in a school but mm. he got he was getting bullied mm. so he just clicked it one day and just yeah. Stabbed someone, right? Stabbed yeah. a couple of people, stabbed the teacher and a student, I think. But he was like smart ass, switched on, young Asian kid, good family. But he just yeah. clicked one day. So every now and then you do see those ones. Mm. But, but they're few and far between, aren't they? Yeah, there's not it's not often. Now if you're um like I, I, I often talk to I talk to people about the why are these kids they are. I, 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 I like to go Joey Williams is a really good guy. I can can connect you with him and he's an Aboriginal guy. He's got this thing he says he doesn't go, Why did you do he goes, What happened to you? 100%. It is yeah. always what happens to you. What happened to you to be what you are? And shout out to Joey Williams. You're a fucking champion. And he's a, he. Joey Williams is a guy that, oh, I, I don't know, he articulates trauma than, better than any psychiatrist, any psychologist I've ever seen, you know. And it should be people like him, yourself, a few of us going to these homes. Because these kids got to, a lot of them kids are running around doing things that they don't even know why they're fucking doing it. 100%. It's like they're fucking, they're fueled by the subconscious, all that fucking trauma. And I see, I was looking at one today, I was looking at, I see some of these fucking things that, like, and the kids are escalating and escalating. Mm. You're a, like, when I was in the boys' homes, there was fucking not many people in there for armed robberies, but when you were in there, there would have been a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I was picking up now murder. Yeah. Kids are getting done for murder. Yeah. I was picking up a bit before I got out. Heaps of kids coming in for murder now and stabbings and whatnot. It's just, it's, yeah, it's different now. It's, it's weird. Scary. It's like the kids coming in now, they're not, they're all drug fried and they're not soldiers. They weren't standing, they weren't standing on their own two feet and bang. Mm. There's a lot of verbals now in juvie. It's mm. not, not much physical alterations anymore. A lot of, but they're getting done for more serious crimes. So it doesn't make sense. Mm. It's, it's weird. It's funny now. It's very strange. Yeah. And that is, it's, and it's, it's escalating. And, that's when you're, and I, was, I, was, I was sitting there and watching a fucking kid ride a skateboard right? mm. the other week. I was at this fucking bowl and I can remember you could do a fucking little... You don't, the tricks you, yeah. we could do when we were kids and the tricks that they're doing today are phenomenal. Motocross bike's another thing. You know, you'd go over two or three jumps and think you're a fucking superstar. Now they're doing a triple backflip yeah. going across. And it's the same as crime. It's escalating and escalating. They're doing... They're, it's more and more... And it's becoming because I think the fucking trauma is heavier and heavier. Yeah, 100%.
But even when you got kids that are fucking broke as fuck, what do you expect them to do? And they're coming from homes that anyone to stay at because their parents are junkies or their parents have beaten them up or dad's beating mum up. And that's funny. Like I went to a thing the other week and I sat in front of a, a guy and he was talking about modern day slavery. Mm. And he was talking about child exploitation. So the one he had about with, with, with girls and that and I understand that completely. Mm. But then he was talking about kids that are used by by bigger criminals to go steal cars and all sorts of stuff. And he's called it modern day slavery, child exploitation. I've sat in front of it, bro, it's not. Have you fucking, have you been broke before? Do mm. you understand? I was like, when you got kids that are stealing top end cars and getting 10 grand for a car. Mm, nothing slavery about that. There's nothing fucking slavery they, about that. They, they, they're going to steal the cars anyway. Transactional. But the kids are stealing the cars anyway. Yeah. Right. But someone's found these kids that are stealing the cars and say, hey, keep on stealing them by bringing them to me and I'll give you money. Yeah, yeah. The car's getting fucking stolen anyway. That's not fucking exploitation. Like, yeah. I feel like that's a telling guy, you're a fucking idiot. Yeah, yeah. That's a problem. There's a lot of people in these positions that don't understand. Yeah. All right? And they just throw out these terms out thinking they're smart and they pull their pants up and wear glasses and that. They think they're you guys are duds, oh, I man. I agree. I agree. I just, some of the things I see these so called experts talking about, I cringe and I go, that's not how it goes down. They've got all these criminologists coming on the news to talk about cr crime and they've done a degree. They've got a piece of paper. Yeah, and yeah. They haven't lived it. Yeah. Sack all the criminologists, get one of us on, and we'll tell you exactly yeah, why they're we'll, doing what they're doing. Yeah, and we'll get the fucking truth about it. It's like that. I, I'm big on it. I'm big on what's going on at home. Let's fucking, we've got these problems with these kids, but let's find out what's going on in the household where they mm. come from. Yeah, well rounded kids, a kid that's validated, and that, that kid that's got that loving family and everything, he doesn't need to go and seek validation in a gang. He's gang's his family. 100%. His gang's his family. That kid that fucking he feels loved that the parents turn up at sporting games and school fucking shit and that. That kid's gang is his family. Because there's all such, there's all a shared experience, right? You're all coming from broken households yeah. and the bond forms, right? And the loyalty you have to each other is like next to none. Yeah. Is some is who's gonna like the loyalty? But it's different kind of loyalty, right? It's like they'll like they'll blade someone for you. But that's a kind of loyalty that you have around there. It's funny, like even like when I was in um, Parliament the other day and I was talking. And I'm big on early intervention. Yeah, yeah, you got to get these kids young. Yeah, yeah. And when they're talking about early intervention, they're talking about 10, 13. I'm like, that's fucking too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Joey Williams talks six. Bro, I reckon zero to two. Yeah, yeah. For example, there was docs coming to my house when my mom was getting belted, coppers coming to the house, and I didn't have to see one professional. Never seen a psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever it may be, until I got locked up. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, when you talk about early intervention, it's got to be that young age, zero to two, zero to five. That's when you got to get kids you can't yeah. get once they're 10, 13 committing crime it's too late. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree, and I agree not has been done. I can't get a fucking blue card because I've got armed robberies. I'm going to do it because I'm going to just take them on. Jeff Morgan just got knocked back for a blue card, and he should have one all Was well, he working with Jordan Check? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's a stranger on that one. And yeah. yeah, the Boy Scout leader that's been a child abuser and everything like that, he seems to be able to get it. It's crazy. Yeah. This whole thing, that whole process, my biggest, I, I'm willing to go out to Dallas Springs and talk to them. I'll pay for them. I'll pay for my accommodation, airfares, and everything. People who don't want me out there is the cops. They don't mm. want us out there. And they'll go, oh, yeah, you got to have your fucking working with children's company come out. There's no use bother coming out here. But the first thing we'll do when we go out there, we'll grab a football, um, boxing mitts, and we'll go to a park and we'll call these kids on. We'll have a barbecue and we'll get talking on them. And we'll, and you know what these coppers don't understand and what these politicians don't understand? Man, even forget about the footy and the boxing mitts and whatever. You get 50 kids in front of me that, have, that are doing crime. And I told them I've, I've just got out. I just served five years. Yeah. Boom. Eyes on. Straight yeah, away. Yeah, straight away. And that's what you got to get. You got to grab their attention. And that's my always my thing is I, I want to know what I'll tell them what I've done. And but then you start taking interest in mm. what's going on for you, man. Hundred percent. How's home? Mum, mum, dad's bashing mum and everything. So why are you walking the streets? Oh, because it's not comfortable. It's not safe at home. I'm gonna get bashed. Why are you walking the streets? Because I've got there's no food at the fucking home. I'm hungry. You know? there's, al there's always issues, man. There's always something that's happened from a so, young age. So let's fucking, let's get them a feed. Let's create a safe space for them. Let's create spots where they can grow and they can fucking look at. In your case, unfortunately, it was for the boys' homes where you got your structure from. You got, you were put in a position where you were going to eat and as much as you wouldn't have liked it and you can, and then you got an opportunity to challenge yourself. You know what I mean? I think creating those sorts of things. I talked to Angelo Hyde as a mate of mine Danny Green's boxing trainer, Maloney Brothers at the moment, he talks about that. He goes, man, he's ex-military, and he talks about that, is going to find out what's going And because he straight away, you're going to identify these kids are walking around, the alcoholic parents, drug addict parents. It's not a nice place to be in them houses. That's shit, man. Especially if you're sitting in the house, bro, and everywhere you look just reminds you of fucking some, something. You've got to get out of there. Yeah, yeah. What can they say in there? And you find your validation in your peers on the street. 100%. Who are... Acting and doing antisocial behaviour. And especially when you had power taken away from you from a young age and you start pumping 
you start doing crime and that, and everyone knows you around the area is not someone to be fucking, not someone to piss off. Yeah. Kind of him. Mm, this stuff's good, you know. Get my power back. Yeah, and you got a different power now. You got admiration. Yeah, 100%. It's different now. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that I was feared by a lot of people, but the certain people that I was feared by, that's where I got my respect from. But now I'm respected because I'm someone I can, you can look up to. Yeah. So yeah. it's a different kind of respect, and it's good. On that note, mate. Uh, honestly, dead set, Kaiser. It's been a dead set fucking a privilege having you. No, thank you for having me. I yeah, appreciate yeah. it. I, I loved having you. I love your story. And how can people get hold of you on your socials? Tell us about you. Yeah, so my Instagram is Kaiser, K Y Z A R J underscore. And yeah, my Insta has my link to my TikTok and all that. I'm always trying to post motivational stuff. Just I've done a couple of podcasts. Shit's gone sideways. Done the clink with mm. Brent and. Mm. Yeah, just trying to share my story, get my story as much as I can. Just It's not even for, I don't even expect to ha change 100 people, 200 people. It's just, even when I go speak to some high school kids, I'm speaking to for because there's that one kid in the crowd I know I'll, I'll stick to. Then you will, oh, you'll get, mate. You'll, as long as I can change one life, one will change two. And yeah. it's just a domino effect. Two, two will change four, and that's how you change the world. Yeah, you're out planting seeds, brother. It's a beautiful thing to be doing, man. You should be so proud. I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. I'm Appreciate proud it. of you. My young bloke couldn't wait for me to get you on it because he loves your story too. And he said, as we do, and he's inspired by it too. So thank you for that. Thank yeah. you for having me. Appreciate it.